I will do a mini introduction. Yeah? Okay. So, Would you like me to sit there or here? Uh, what looks better? What do you think? I think it looks better without me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, downstairs at the uh, Würstel box, the sausages box, he said, Thomas Zetlacek said two very, very interesting things. Uh, he ordered a sausage. He said, hi, I'm a Czech tourist. And then later, while we were standing there, he said, I'm coming from the suburbs, from Vienna, from Austria. Was that a joke? No. No? I, I think we had our happiest time when we were, you know, enchanted by the, what we used to call prison of nations, which was the Anglo-Australian Empire. And, you know, that was the happiest times that we've had for a long, long time. Is it over? Well, you know. Welcome. I'm extremely, we, the team of the Kunsthalle Levin, delighted to have, to have Thomas Zetlacek with us here today. Thomas Zetlacek, a man who is thinking and writing on economics, poses questions about the fundamentals of our current economic system. Thomas Zetlacek is a Czech economist, the chief macroeconomist of the CO, CSOB sorry, Bank. He lectures at the Charles University and is a member of the National Economic Council in Prague. He is also a well, after the crisis, no, a very well-known columnist, radio presenter, in which you, what you will see shortly, a TV commentator. He is one of the most provoking thinkers and economists working today. His book, Economist, Econ Economics of Good and Evil, is about the philosophy, ethics, and the history of, of economic thought. It has provided an invaluable commentary of the current economic situation, as well as much needed proposals for a completely new order in an economic situation which had, has reached an unprecedented moment, which we all know, moment of stasis. In the book, he describes economies as a cultural phenomenon. He says it is a product of our civilization closely tied with philosophy, myth, religion, anthropology, and the arts. According to Zetlicek, econom economics should not concern only abstract mathematic mathematical modeling, but also society's values. Is the economy depressed, or has it just been missed, misdiagnosed? We will hear what Thomas has to say to us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, <clears throat> of course, uh, this goes without saying that it is a great pleasure to be here in Vienna today uh, debating with you on what it is that's actually happening. You know, I cannot... Uh, not react to the beautiful thing that we have just heard. Where is the singer? Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I don't know if you also, like myself, have always wondered why do they put these things in the news? Numbers that nobody really understands and very few people care about. And in fact, I've never met a single person who cares about these Dove indexes. The professionals get them 15 minutes earlier than everybody else. Why do they put them on the news? And as I was thinking about this, it seemed to be, and, and what you did was a perfect enactment of that, that it really is enchanting. It is uh, uh, a voice that we need to hear in order to believe that there is some significant other who has these numbers and thus also 
reality of the world under control, that these numbers are important, that really these are the essence of what has happened in the day. Not the zoo story, not the politics, not the arts, not anything from the bonfires that were started in wildlife in Australia, but these numbers really encompass the essence of what has happened in the day. While nobody cares, understands, or deals with these numbers effectively, they are there precisely for the rest of us to believe that things are under some sort of control. Because they are numbers and they go up or down and they change the very reality from which other things then spur, occur, happen, spin and twist the news of the day. But by you putting it into this choral, uh, you have really wonderfully shown the essence of these things. I think 10 years down the line, that's the way they're going to be sung in the news. And that's the way when it finally will make proper meaning to all of us. It's really enchantment, a confirmation that things do have some sort of logic, which none of us understands, but nevertheless, there is some other that uses those, masters those, controls those, and keeps you in, in good health in all natural and unnatural respects. <clears throat> so anyway, that's just a, a, a prelude, a way of thanking you for doing what, you, what, you, what you've just uh, uncovered very, very beautifully. Just imagine that this would be the way that these news would be presented on TV, on Bloomberg, on CNN, on BBC, every evening. You know, the ideology would be immediately transparently visible. But that must not happen. That's exactly why you have people in ties and very serious faces quoting things in Latin to them that they absolutely don't understand. I mean, of course, the biggest secret is that there is no meaning in these numbers. And that's exactly why there is so much beating around the bush to try to make sure that these are the essentials, so to speak, of, of the news. So, but anyway, the topic of the, 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 the lecture or the debate that I, that I want to share with you today is uh, economics as a misdiagnosed um, um, uh, illness, so to speak. Before I go any further, I would like to invite you, because this is a very, uh, let's say, comfortable sum of people, at any time, do interrupt me, do jump in, just, you know, scream at me, and I would like to, you know, react as you are reacting uh, to me. So, what is the diagnosis that you hear in the newspaper uh, on a daily basis? You hear from economists, you hear from from politicians that the economy is depressed. So suddenly we economists use medical terminology. Always we've been using sort of mathematical terminology deep down, but when times are tough we borrow the language of, 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 of medicine. Now depression is a uh, illness that happens to many of us, to all the reasonable people in any way. Uh, one way or another, but still it's a misdiagnosis, I would argue. I think the proper diagnosis of uh, the health of the body of economics is not that it's depressed, but that it is manic depressed. And bipolar disorder, which is commonly called manic depression, is a completely different sort of um, an illness, and it also must be treated differently than depression. For depression, it is enough, so to speak, to give antidepressants, in other words, medications that increase the energy or the mood of the patient. And it is good news when that patient regains her or his energies and starts being vital again. If you deal, however, with a manic depressed person, and you give him or her antidepressants, the fact that his or her mood 
comes back is not in itself good news. Why? Because exactly the reversion into the manias is at hand or quite possibly to happen. To treat only the depressions in a manic depressed person is like to treat hangovers only when you deal with an alcoholic. Now, of course, every alcoholic will find his or her problem in exactly this event that we collectively, called hangover, collectively call hangovers. But if we even come up with a perfect silver bullet for hangovers, this does not solve the problem. The problem of an alcoholic is not the hangover the next morning. The problem of an alcoholic is an excessive use of alcohol the night before. By the way, and I must compliment you Austrians for inventing a, yet another new cover for alcohol. Although it looks like jam, and it may make you jam later, it, it is it's vodka inside. So it's always the packaging that uh, sells. But anyway, um, if you come up with a perfect treatment for hangovers, you are not really solving the problem of an alcoholic. The problem of an alcoholic is an excessive use of alcohol, not hangovers themselves. And if you invent a perfect cure for hangovers, you're not making the alcoholism of that person better. In fact, arguably, you are making the alcoholism worse because now it has no side effects. And if you look into the description of a manic depressive person, there are three basic characteristics that we apply to, uh, to, to manias. First of all, these people, while they are in their manic stage, read the present and the future with rosy, very sanguine glasses. In other words, everything seems possible, everything seems doable, and the future is going to be better and better every single instant of the day. Secondly, that person spends much more money than they can afford. This is a very clear sign of, of manias. These people shop voraciously. Now, of course, there is no need to translate this into what has been happening with our economies uh, before the crises. We have mistaken a cycle for a trend. We also thought everything is going to be better and better and better. The house prices will rise forever and ever and ever. And uh, even Alan Greenspan was credited with finally inventing the end of the boom and bust economy. Ever since time immemorial, the economy has always been going in cycles. We now call these business cycles. It's never been an exception to it. It always went up and then it went down, and then it went up again, and then it went down. In fact, you can go as far in the history as 3,000 years back to the first business cycle that was recorded in the history of mankind, which is the famous example that nobody thinks of, but everybody knows of it, but few people connect it because it's Sunday school stuff, and you're not supposed to connect your Sunday morning things with your Monday morning things. But the first business cycle in the history of mankind can be very easily found in the 41st chapter of the book of Genesis, the first book of Moses, when Pharaoh has a dream. You know, Pharaoh has a dream about seven fat cows and seven lean cows. And, you know, here one always has to be careful, or I try to be careful, not to look on anyone in particular when I speak of the seven fat cows. Yeah. But he does not understand the meaning of the dream, so he summons Joseph, who was a Hebrew prophet, who could interpret dreams. And Joseph tells him, well, you know, congratulations, Pharaoh, you've just had the first macroeconomic prediction in the written history of mankind. Your land, Egypt, will have seven years of plenty, 
And then, after that, you will have seven years of famine. This is what the dream means. You have seen the future 14 years ahead of time. And Pharaoh says, well, you know, thank you very much for that very valuable piece of information. Could you also tell me or give me an advice as to what to do? So Joseph becomes Pharaoh's first, shall we say, economic advisor, perhaps even the minister of finance. And Joseph gives him very simple advice. He tells him, in the times of the mania of the seven very rich years, do not consume everything that grows. Save one-fifth of your wealth and curb down your levels of consumption. Yes, you could consume all of it, but don't consume all of it. Be wise and save a little bit of that energy for later when times will get rough. Now that's one example of the, of the, uh, of this sort of manic depression, manic depressive behavior because the economy does have sort of an internal tendency to overdo its good years into manias and, it, and its bad years into suicidal depression. So Joseph here was, was quite wise and, you know, ordered not antidepressants but mood stabilizers. So the role, so there are a couple of lessons that we can learn from this quite, quite easily. Uh, seven years here and seven years here, and this would be time. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, because Pharaoh listened to the story, he could go through a very severe economic crisis without a single penny of debt, which to us, very advanced people, some 3,000 years later, is something absolutely even outside of the realm of fantasy. The only way how we are debating how to sort of solve the depression is by debt. We can't even think outside of it. In fact, we don't even have a name for it. We speak, we speak of debt to GDP ratio, but if a nation would have resources, we don't have a name for that we would have to say negative debt to GDP ratio. So if country today behaved like Egypt, according to the story, some perhaps 3,000 years back, we wouldn't have a name for it. Government savings, government uh, resources uh, is not a fit word to describe that. So that's the lesson number one that stems exactly from the misdiagnosis is the only way how we can sort of survive the crisis is to go even further into, into debt. Second lesson is that the role of an economist, and I think this is quite important for us to realize, the role of an economist was never to increase GDP. The role of an economist is to increase GDP in the times of famines and, and crises, but the role of a proper economist, a politician, or anybody who tries to behave responsibly, is to decrease the possible GDP growth during the good years. We have forgotten that part of the business cycle. You know, in one way, you can say that this is sort of Keynesianism a little bit before Keynes was born. But today, we are even left of Keynes. I mean, Keynes today would be sort of a right-winger. Uh, today, we live in a world that is dominated uh, by public policy, which I call bastard Keynesianism. We took half of Keynes and multiplied it by two, which isn't the same thing like the original. If you have a portion of Wiener Schnitzel with potatoes, and you take half of that plate, let's say just the potatoes, and you multiply it by two, you don't get the original serving. Uh, we today only know 
sort of deficits. That's the way we, uh, we think. That's the way we, uh, we hope. In this, we can talk about the third sort of lesson to be learned. In, in psychoanalysis, we talk of traumas. Traumas are usually associated with negative events in your life. I would claim that traumas can also be caused by positive experiences in your life. You meet something so sublimely beautiful, it creates a, a trauma-like dent in your psychological time-space continuum. So like a black hole that cannot be explained because it is a singularity, but you can see its effects, it attracts matter, even bends light, even bends time and space. We have in our brains, I think, traumas of two opposite natures. One trauma is caused by negative experiences, rape, neglect, violence, etc. But also of traumas that are caused by excessively positive experiences. And these two, I would say, also become attractors in your life. You enjoy something excessively beautiful and you cannot be grateful for it, but you want it to repeat itself over and over again. Even wishing that your life would be looped, so to speak, in a recursive thought or a recursive event. This is something that we can learn from Oscar Wilde and the picture of Dorian Gray because the trick there was if Dorian Gray once said, this is so sublimely beautiful, I don't want it to pass, I want to stay, I want to linger in the moment forever and ever, this is where he lost his bet. And that, I would find, is uh, a nice description of the positive trauma. Now, the problem with positive traumas is that you tend to, you tend to fetishize them. You tend to believe that you have some sort of a divine right for this order of things to be reoccurring forever and ever and ever. Um, one of the things with depressed people is that their thoughts become recursive and there is no way how you can break the vicious cycle. I think that this same recursiveness happens quite consciously during what I call the, the, the positive driven traumas. And that's in one way, what has happened, I would claim, with, with us today. We've had a very, mod, a very, very generous seven years, and now we can't live without it. If you listen, and you don't even have to listen very carefully to all the debates of the economists and of the politicians, what they're basically saying is, we want our manias back. Give us back our manias, give us back our unsustainability. We all know that it's unsustainable, not just for ecological reasons, but for the reasons from within the system. It's absolutely unsustainable. Nevertheless, we want it back. We want back the positive traumas without the side effects of the hangover. And we, the question of today is how to produce that intoxication with the positive without causing causing hangovers. So that's the third or fourth lesson. One. <clears throat> what else can we learn from this very, very old story? Well, the fifth lesson would be that, um, you know, this is a very primitive story. This is a story that you could tell to a seven-year-old child and he or she would understand. Today we produce 100,000 of economists that speak in a language that nobody understands, not even themselves. It's a language full of matrices, full of differential equations, full of very, very sophisticated math, but we have failed to see this. We have absolutely failed to behave according to some sort of I don't know, wisdom is maybe too big a word, but what we did during our seven years, which was from the year 2001 to 2008, is we did this. Not only did we consume everything that grew, but we consumed a little bit more. 
Why? Because yes, we can. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, these, this is even sort of a little bit, it rhymes, and I don't want this to sound too sort of, you know, numerological, but the, these seven years of very strong growth have been even bracketed by two very significant events. One was September 11 of 2001, which was the, not just the terrorist attack, but this was also the last year that American federal budget was in the surplus. And this was the year that Fed started giving the economy artificially low interest rates, which caused this, and also artificially high budget deficits, which caused also this. So there was a double imperative to the economy from the state of the government. Now, the role of a government is exactly to do this, to work against, so to speak, the manic depressive tendencies of the economy. The role of an economist, as I already said, is to slow down the manias and give a little bit of speed. Now that we're talking drugs, speed, I think, as a drug, works very perfectly for uh, describing what it is that we really want today. We want speed. We want growth. So you had September 11, 2001, and the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank also happened in September. It was September 18, so it was a seven-day miss there. But in other words, we had, as Europe, or even more fitting for America, seven years of very strong and prosperous times. Um, how could we fail to see that? Now everybody asks. How could we be so drunk or so intoxicated as to uh, fail something that a seven-year-old understands and that something that people with PhDs fail to see? Now, uh, this model, this is also a model, very little mathematics, but it's a model, it's a verbal model. This model has been forged and put together without any assumptions of perfect rationality, without any high-level mathematics or econometrics, even without very sophisticated math. And yet today, and perhaps precisely because of that, we were unable to behave, but from a benefit of hindsight, we all acknowledge some sort of intoxication, a folly, that would see. So that was the fifth thing. Sixth thing, you will say, but you know, these guys had an advantage of having dreams. We no longer have dreams that reveal the future, or believable dreams that reveal believable future. What is it today that reveals the future? Well, we have models. Models are made for one purpose only, in this case, and that is to reveal the future. That's why we have these models. We use all these models of homo economicus, of, you know, assumptions of rationality and being able to order your preferences. In other words, this is a, quite a strong assumption that people actually know what they want. Uh, and being able to um, put all of that together, we do this for one reason only, and that is to be able to calculate. Otherwise, we don't need these models. In fact, we don't need these models at all. We have all these models in economics only to calculate human behavior with the intent to predict the future. So you have two things. In the past, it was the dream that revealed the future, according to this story anyway. Today, we have models, economic models, mathematical models. Now, of course, when you, hear, when you see this first, you think, well, this, these two words could not be any more different. I mean, dreams and models are exactly almost in perfect con contradiction. This is rational, this is emotional, this is objective, this is subjective, this is very fuzzy, this is very exact. And I could go on and on to sort of 
drive the differences between a, a dream and a model. But also, if I would flip the coin, these two spheres are not as different as we would think. Why? Well, when we create models, do we not dream also? Models are created, I would argue, in a very similar realm like dreams are. If I want to create a model, I absolutely need to disattach myself from my senses. I close my eyes, so to speak, and I imagine a world where, for example, human beings are rational. I imagine a world where human beings are mathematically approachable, or um, um, uh, it is possible to simplify human behavior in mathematical terms. I dream of a world where human beings are egoistic. I dream of a world where human beings maximize their utility. I dream of a world where people know what makes them happy or what increases or decreases their utility. Uh, so dreams and models are not that different as we would like to think. Please also remember that the father of modern science, René, René Descartes, invented this whole theory in a dream. If you read the Principia Philosophica from, from Descartes, where he actually quite originally um, establishes the maneuver space of today's science, he puts the reader or yourself into a dream. Imagine that you're dre dreaming, how would you know the real from the imaginary. So inside of your dream, you perhaps see a tree. That tree is visual. It has a visual impression on you. You can hear the leaves in the dream. You can go even, and in that dream, you can even touch the tree, etc., etc. And this is how he sort of knits the, the method of, of modern science together, you know, he comes to the very famous conclusion, even though I can doubt anything that I see, feel, or touch, or sense, I know that there is something that does these events, and he comes to this famous um, cogito ergo sum, uh, which can be translated in, in many ways, but usually it's translated like, I doubt, or I think, therefore I am. It could also be translated as, I am conscious, cogito, I am conscious. Therefore, I am, which would completely enlarge the sphere of, um, of, 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 of science today because consciousness is something that we do not respect. We respect the rational, the rational part. So, um, uh, anyway, so that's, that's perhaps even, I would argue that the old myths and the modern myths are also not so different. Sallust, who was a uh, pre-Socratic philosopher, defined myth in the following way. He said, myth is something that never happened, but it's happening always. Uh, Homo economicus perfectly uh, falls under that category. Have you ever met a homo economicus in your life? No, of course not. But then again, everybody is one. There is nothing you can do to escape the behavior of homo economicus. Even Jesus Christ, according to uh, this myth, has been optimizing some sort of utility curve. A post-mortem, perhaps, but still a utility curve. So if you look at the world rationally, it will look rationally back. This is the sort of the continuation of the quote from Nietzsche. If you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you. If you look at the world rationally, it looks rationally back. If you are immersed in a myth, everything seems to be a fact from the vantage point of the myth. So let me give a very... Uh, sort of practical example. If you watch Star Wars, for example, you have to enter the world of Star Wars, so to speak, just to be able to watch it. Um, you have to believe in lightsabers, you have to believe in force, 
you have to believe in uh, you know speed travel etc etc if you fail to do this star wars are unwatchable i do this with my father <clears throat> i used to do it with my father who is a very technical type he's a pilot we would watch star wars together as children oh, well when i was a child he was already a little bit ahead of me um, uh, as an adult you know, after the first five minutes, he would say, no, come on, that's stupid. That's, you know, that, that would never fly. And, you know, he would have very good points, too. He said, you know, if, if they're shooting at each other with, you know, light blasters, these blasters would travel at the speed of light, so you wouldn't be able to see them, and you wouldn't be able to duck them. Which, you know, technically speaking, yes, of course, daddy... As always, you're right, but it's a movie, you know. It's a fictional world, it's called Star Wars, and there different rules apply. <clears throat> when you enter, I claim, in the world of science, you are entering a somewhat similar field of fiction like when you're watching a movie like Star Wars or Matrix or vampire movies. And I think this is the ultimate joke of the, uh, of the movie makers. If you've noticed, you must have noticed, in every vampire movie, there is always a character of the rational doubter. It's usually a man who says in the movie about vampires, but vampires don't exist. And you're sitting there as a viewer, you know, almost screaming at that character, saying, oh, come on, can't you see, just look around at you. You know, the evidence is brutally against your hypothesis. Of course, vampires exist, and you must be stupid not to believe that, and you will pay for the lack of your proper faith or belief. This is the ultimate joke, because, of course, that person there in the movie represents ourself two hours after the movie is over. We also are in our cognitive self, people who actually don't believe in vampires, do we? But when you watch the movie, you make fun out of people that don't believe in vampires. And this is exactly, I would claim, the same realm that you enter as an economist when you fantasize about the world where markets clear, where you fantasize about the world where human beings are rational, when you fantasize about the world which is governed by this invisible hand of the markets. Now, I believe in the invisible hand, but not of the markets. I believe in the invisible hand of, of a society. And this somehow seems to work quite well. Now, in your pockets, you have cell phones that are very intelligent, the smartphones, or maybe you use a computer. These are governed by systems we call those systems, we call them programs. These programs are 100% mathematically rational. They're algorithms with no emotions, no Oedipus complexes, no hatred, no religious beliefs. It's a perfect mathematical system, made to be a logical algorithm with no side effects. Yet, these programs freeze from time to time even though they are perfectly rational. Now, the question of course comes, how come the society, which is also a system, much more sophisticated system than a computer system, how come the society never freezes? Now, the society has a subset of it that does freeze. Economics, for example, that's what we saw in the year 2008, it froze. Uh, it got itself into a, some sort of a crunch. And we were very surprised that, that, uh, that it happened. Why we experience this on a weekly basis with our computers? And the only thing that you're left with when your computer freezes is to do the good old IT crowd <coughs> advice. Well, you know, turn it off and on again. Uh, but the society as a whole never freezes completely. It has sections of it that freeze, but other sections come to its aid. In this, in this case, it was politics 
that came to aid when the body of economics was sort of, sort of frozen. And it helped and it covered it up. Sometimes politics freezes and arts come to defreeze it. Or the other way around, sometimes the body of art or something else freezes and, and something else comes to its, to its aid to mend the, the dent, so to speak. So when the society becomes too corporate, you have a generation of hippies to sort of correct it in a little bit of a dialectical, dialectical fashion. So my question is, why have we attributed these self-regulatory moments to just one part of the society? Why do we talk of the invisible hand of the markets? Why don't we talk of the invisible hand of politics? Why don't we talk of the invisible hand of art? Because art also reacts to each other in sort of self-regulatory way. And this is the problem. We have fetishized one part of the body, giving it supernatural uh, properties. The markets are rational. We believe them to be rational, even more rational than every single actor within that market. There is sort of the, the element of the pure fetish, so to speak. I mean, again, if I may use an example from popular culture, let's take, or even better, from modern myths, let's take Lord of the Rings. There, you will notice Gollum, who owns the ring, no longer really uses the ring. But he still wants it. Why does he want the ring? You don't, he doesn't use it for any you know, purposes. He only wants to own the ring for the ownership itself. It has become his precious. Exactly, not for the function anymore, but for what I call pure fetish. It just becomes excessively important for him to possess, his, possess it, even to the point of death, just to own it in a weird fashion. So, and I think this is the mistake, and this is the misdiagnosis that we have made today, is we have sort of given the attributes of the whole to one part, and namely to, to economics. It can self-regulate, it can lead us even into the future. Why doesn't art lead us, now that we are here in the, you know, art hall, why isn't it that art should lead us into the future? Why, are, why is it the markets leading us into the future? What do the markets want? You know, sometimes it's very useful, I think, to sort of take the body of the economy and say, what does the body of economy want from us? What does the body of economy want? Well, it wants to grow. It wants to... Um, the more it gets into trouble, the, the more it wants to repeat the same trick, which is sort of a basic characteristic of the fetish, and I will end with this, and then I and I and I hope to launch into, into into a debate. Or, or if you have any comments or questions, or uh, anything, you know the way I see fetish is something that promises to make you whole, while in fact it creates the very dent that it promises to cover. So. Uh, it looks like it's going to give you freedom, but in fact, it gives you dependency. This is the modus vivendi of, 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 of us today. Shampoo for your hair originally looks like it's going to give you more beautiful hair, but what it in fact does, you will have ugly hair without it. A beauty cream tells you, I will make you more beautiful. But what in fact it does is you are ugly without the beauty cream. This is the topic of all advertisement. You see, you know, usually ladies when it comes to beauty creams, you know, with cracked up faces looking like 60-year-old witches. And the problem is exactly that you have not applied this ugly, de-ugliness. The, the cream is supposed to de uglize you, in fact. You know, this is the proper meaning of, or let's take, for example, yogurts. 
advertisements for yogurts. I mean, you must have the same advertisements like we have on, in my country. The, the story goes like this, you know, there's a family, sunshine, early morning, husband wakes up already sexy and, and with teeth brushed and the children are looking forward to going to school and it's all because of Yogobella yogurts. And if you as the lady of the house fail to have mornings like this, then it is exactly and precisely because you did not buy these wonderful miracle making yogurts. And uh, so while it promises you the road to salvation, the road to excessive pleasures, the road to freedom, the road to being complete, you cannot be complete without that shampoo. You cannot be complete without the car and yogurts and all that. It, in the same way, exactly constitutes the stumbling block that prevents you from you being yourself. Um, let me, let me, and this exactly is, I think, what is happening now today with, with, with economics. It promises us to be free, but in fact, the way we read economics today, it's exactly limiting us. That's what you read and hear all the time. The economy limits us, while originally it was supposed to make us, make us free. Most strikingly, you can see this with consumption or with the body of economics on the whole. What led us into the crisis? Economics. What will lead us out of it? Even more economics. What led us into the crisis? Was too much overconsumption at the expense of credit. We've heard this 10,000 times. What will lead us out of it? Even more consumption at the expense of, of the credit. What led us into the crisis? Too low interest rates. What will lead us out of it? Well, even lower interest rates. And now, this is not unique. We tend to fetishize other things as well. We Europeans, for example, fetishize the idea of a nation state. hundred years ago, you could not be a true Czech if you didn't have your own nation state. We used to call um, Austria or the uh, Unger Austrian Empire the prison of nations. So we had to have Every nation had to have its own state. And we all know that this exactly led to the destruction of, of peoples of, of Europe. It led to war. So you see very often what I call, or what can be called subject-object reversal, something that's supposed to serve you, you end up serving. And um, if you fetishize it. So, and this is, I promise, my last example. Let's take Matrix, for example. The topic there is machines are supposed to slave for us. Then something goes wrong. We have become the slaves of machines. You can see this also in the Lord of the Rings. The ring was forged by Sauron and by Mordor exactly to give Mordor more power over the Middle Earth. But then at the end of the story, we learned that there was a subject-object reversal. If you destroy the ring, a very small thing, if you destroy that, Mordor is destroyed. You can see this in, in uh, the Golem of Prague. You can see this in Aladdin's Lamb. Something that's supposed to serve you, if you fetishize it, you become its slave. Uh, you can even see this very well in Kundera who uh, very often has this sort of a narrative in his, in his fiction. Man usually starts a game of sexual nature, usually with a female, exactly because this game promises to give him more sexual enjoyment, more degrees of freedom, more maneuver space, more full expression of himself. And then something goes wrong, and this game gains a life of its own, even though game is a dead object, it becomes, one way or another, it becomes alive, and it becomes uh, the dictate machine of the original player itself. So from a puppeteer, you become a puppet endorsed and enslaved by the very game that he himself 
started. This you see exactly materializing today when it comes to debt. Originally, debt, budget, deficits, government debt was exactly something that was supposed to give us more freedom to buy more schools, more roads, more money to pensioners, more money to youngsters, more money to everybody. If you misuse it, if you fetishize it, if you come to believe that this is the only way how to move forward, it will become your owner. And that's exactly the situation that we are today. We are effectively here in the West, the slaves of our debts. In other words, we today have become slaves of our past freedoms. We no longer can move as we will. We have to follow what the markets want. We have to do what the debt wants us to do. Um, so if we do not defetishize this, we will never be able to move out of it. In the same way we have fetishized the idea of a nation state, while there is nothing wrong with the idea of a nation state, if you fetishize it, it will end up in bloody wars. There is nothing wrong with economics, except when you fetishize the excessively positive events, making it into trauma that you want to repeat over and over again, it will effectively destroy you and enslave you, which is exactly the meaning of government bankruptcy, which is exactly the horror element of the discourse today. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your... Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I would like to start with a question which probably others are questioning themselves as well. If you are saying, because we are all looking for answers, um, uh, if you are saying that modern economics are more fiction than fact, uh, do we need new economic myths to find our way out of our current problems? Uh, you know, new communism, or I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, first of all, I, I don't think that we want an answer. Yes. I think we want better questions. In fact, <laughs> okay. you know, I would just dip a little bit deeper. If we really wanted perfect answers, then 42 is the answer. Hmm? You know, and that is a perfect mathematical objective answer, only exactly the questions are missing. The whole point of um, Douglas Adams trilogy composed of four parts, which is, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is that the answer is correct, but we don't know the question. And... Um, but this is art. Sorry, what? This is, that's what you're saying, it's art. This is what we are doing. Yes, 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 yes. Huh? And, this you know, exactly there are no are doing answers. Here. There are no answers in art. You know, this is the cliche that Oscar Wilde once said about art, that art, all art must be quite useless. This is the ending line, which you all, of course, know. And that's exactly the point. There are a couple of elements in the society that can afford not to be useful. And that's the connecting line between art and philosophy. Philosophy even should go against useful. And even art, many art goes exactly. But anyway, sorry, that's, that's just a, No, I totally But your agree. question was different. <laughs> your, what no, was your my question? question is exactly about this. Yes. Do we need new answers? Um, we, we don't have any new, new, new answers. And this is, this is something that even, even the extreme left will admit. <clears throat> Communism is not the answer, and there are no other alternatives except for the no alternative. I come from a communist country. But you were born 1977. That's true. Do you, do you remember it? Is I, was, I, I think I'm the last generation that remembers it. I was 13 when the revolution came, so my father would take me to, 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 to all the demonstrations and all the revelations. Little clue that I have really of what's happening. But even a small child, and this is the funny thing, even the small child could see through the ideology of communism. And there's not a single one example on this beautiful planet that we live in where communism did not end up in totalitarianism. Take the difference between West Germany and East Germany. Take the difference between Austria, your beautiful country, and my country that was 
that we were on the same level. Now, you know, it's taking us decades to sort of be able to come and have a Sacher Dort in Sacher Hotel. But we can do it slowly. Um, North Korea, South Korea. I mean, and the left does not have any functional answer also. And the fundamental difference between, I mean, communism and capitalism are not even on the same level. Why? Because in capitalism, you can have as much communism as you want to. You can go and have a little farm where you don't use money, you only produce, I mean, eat what you yourself produce, and you don't watch TV, you don't do anything with internet and the like, and even the society would applaud you. Nobody would look down on you today. People would really, quite honestly, respect that, and many would even say, oh, that must be a very beautiful life. Nothing stops you. Now, you can't really do that in communism. You can't have a capitalist experiment, okay, dear, you know, Ceausescu, whoever, we want to have a little capitalist village here in the middle, middle of communism. So what is the, the plague of fantasies to quote Zizek? And even Zizek, I mean, this is a video that he posted, I think, three months ago, in which he says, we have no alternative. And this is, you know, Slavoj Zizek, the, I think the most impressive spokesperson, if I may say so, of, of, of the new left. He says, we have no, we don't know. And, 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 and this is the fact. So that's why I am, and I saw this, say this with a little bit of a joke, I am a reformed capitalist. To give a, another example, cars. Cars are a wonderful idea. We all use them. But still, cars have become in many countries the reason number one of unnecessary death. Now, what's the response? Should we go back to horses? No. Let's try and maybe drive them slower, improve the safety, improve the rules of traffic, I don't know, something. But not go back to, to, to the horses. That simply would not work. That's why I believe that... Um, I, in fact, I'm, I'm a more fervent believer in, in, in capitalism than my right-wing friends or, or extreme right-wing colleagues. Why? Because they claim, again, a subject-object reversal, which has become quite important. In the beginning, we all believed, I think, that capitalism, or let's say democratic capitalism, is a fertile ground for growth. I believe that still. But what has happened in the past, let's say, generation, there was a subject-object reversal here as well. Today, we effectively believe that growth is a conditio sine qua non of market democracy. In other words, deprive us of growth and markets collapse. This is the horror story you hear all the time in the newspaper. Even worse, deprive us of growth, democracy will collapse. Or even, even worse, deprive us of growth and we cease to be Europeans. So I think the proper way, well not the proper way, but better way of calling the it's not really a crisis of capitalism proper. It is a crisis of growth capitalism. The only problem with capitalism really is that it doesn't grow. In other words, it still displays the same problems that it displayed 20 years ago. You know, poorer, poorer, richer, richer. We've seen this all the uh, Why have we become so mad about it now? Well, because it doesn't grow. So it's a problem. It's a crisis of <clears throat> growth capitalism because somewhere we have the idea that if it's proper, it has to grow all the time. So I don't know of an alternative that would work for this whole society, and I don't know of anybody who knows a proper alternative for the whole society. Yeah, but, but you see, you are giving them now an answer. Some you know, sort of... That's judgment, you know? Okay. So, but I, I like it very much, because that is exactly what we are trying to do here since the last five days with that festival. You know, we don't have an answer. Yes, perfect. Good. Um, Hi, so um, my question is, um, if, uh, if we're enslaved, if we're enslaved to debt, why isn't the solution um, to break the spell as debt, debt amnesty? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> no, okay. 
if you want an answer, you would all lose your bank savings if we did that. Because we are, and this is the funny part about it, we are enslaved, so to speak, to ourselves. Because the money that government borrows is usually from banks, and banks lend that money out of the savings that you have put in. This is why the, the Cypriot bankruptcy is exactly how a bankruptcy proper sort of looks like. The government goes bankrupt, you lose your money. That's why it's not so easy. But your question is, 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 is quite good because, again, in the Old Testament, but you can find this in other sources as well, not just the Old Testament. Many cultures have this provision. They, they uh, talk about the debt amnesty, the year of Jubilee, which is something quite fundamental, something that we economists never, I think, properly understood until, until now. Uh, let me again come to the example with the, compu with, uh, with the computer programs. They freeze. Every system, and maybe this is also an answer to your question, every system freezes. Even if you have interest rates, no interest rates, money, no money, bio, non-bio, whatever. Every system, no matter how perfect it is, even if it's computer-like perfect, even if it's math-like perfect, even those systems freeze. So instead, and this is my not deconstructionist, but constructionist sort of, um, uh, let's say, attempt to enrich the debate, instead of trying to invent the perfect system, in which I think will always fail, let's try to, to invent ways in which we can reboot the system without bloodshed. So let's say, let's, let's, let's say that you know for fact that your computer will freeze once a week. Let's just assume that you know this. The clever thing to do is to reboot the system on Sunday evening when you're watching your TV and you're not working on the computer, you don't need the computer. You just reset it preemptively. Even though it's not frozen, you reset it. If you fail to do this, of course everybody knows, your computer will freeze exactly at the most unlikely moment. When you don't have your work saved, when you're rushing to print something for a presentation or dissertation, that's the moment when your computer decides to malfunction. For some reason, even these computers have emotions. Yeah, so uh, they would do every 49 years, they would reset the system, sort of you can keep the cash, but let's eliminate the most extreme versions of richness, and the most extreme versions of poverty. Let's return the land to original owners. And those people who have become the slaves of debt, we will set them free. This is a more fundamental question maybe than even we realize because the word for debt in the New Testament Greek, and this is the same in German, is sin, schuld. This works in Aramaic, this works in Latin, demininos debita nostra, forgive us our, or diminish our debts. And this is, in fact, even more fundamental because this is what, when Jesus starts talking about his public, this was his first sort of public lecture, if you will, in Capernaum, he starts reading exactly this text from Isaiah. From Isaiah. I have come to proclaim the year of Jubilee, the year of forgiveness. I have come to set the debt slaves free I have come to forgive debts. Uh, so one way how to read the crisis is that we do not know how to work with forgiveness. The bummer is we all need, we all know that we need to forgive the banks, the Greeks, the Irish, etc., etc. But we don't really know how to work with it. Uh, in one way, the Greek debate is really a continuation of this Christian debate started at least 2,000 years ago. Is it the law that governs the reality like the Pharisees claimed? Or is it something else like love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness? Love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness are fundamentally things that can be never put into law 
into a system. The moment you start putting love into a system, you're ridiculing it. The moment you make rules about forgiveness, it ceases to be forgiveness. So the, the debate is, should we forgive Greeks? <coughs> or should we treat them according to the law? Because yes, you've signed it here with your own blood. You should, you know, honor, it's a law. Do we treat the Greeks according to the law? Or according to grace? And if my brother debts against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times? Or seven to seven times? We don't know. And even, in fact, if you read the Financial Times today, with a little bit of, well, you don't even need much fantasy. You only need to know that the word debt and sin are synonyms. So, you're reading the newspaper saying, the Greeks have fallen under the weight of their sin. They can no longer, longer carry it. They need someone to redeem them. They need somebody to take their debts upon his shoulder and pay them. Somebody with higher credit. Credo in Latin means faith. So somebody whose faith is stronger than that of Greeks. And the problem with Greeks is that we no longer believe their story. We believe the German story. We don't believe the Greek story. And again, we only believe it because it follows from a myth, but, but by, by myth I don't mean a negative thing. By myth I don't mean that it's a lie. By myth I mean it's, an, it's sort of an ideology that we all believe. And this I think is the problem of our times exactly, that we no longer realize the myths that we believe in. You know, our generation of our mothers and our fathers went to church, okay, again, stupid example, went to church and there they realized what it is that they believe. I believe, I'm, I don't know this for fact, but I believe in the Father, in the blood, etc., etc., etc. Today we have no longer any distance from our ideology. In other words, we have believed our own propaganda, so to speak. And the home run of every ideology is to appear like a non-ideology. In fact, it is to appear like a fact. And this is the process how it happens in the body of economics, if I may. In the morning, you know, economists meet in their laboratory. I mean, this is another myth. There, I've never seen an economic laboratory in my life. But in a fictional space, economists meet in a laboratory. Maybe we should also wear white gowns. You know, the only difference between us and the Middle Ages is that the holders of the truth in the Middle Ages were people in black gowns. Today, the holders of the truth are people in white gowns, which is a huge upgrade, by the way. Uh, so, you know, what shall we do? Well, you know, let's make a model. Fine. What shall we assume? Well, let's assume that human beings like yellow color. No, that's stupid. Okay, let's assume that human beings like to jump on their left leg. Nah. Let's assume that human beings are rational. Oh, that seems very rational. Let's sort of try and play with that. And let's assume that human beings have a utility curve. Let's assume that human beings, you know, are egoistic and da 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 Okay, and you construct a nice little model. So far, so good. Even a physicist, when they want to calculate the free fall, they assume that the friction of air does not affect the calculation. That's okay. It's a myth, and we know it's a myth. What happens, and where the problem is, when later on, these economists go to a pub in the evening, which is, some of them do that. Some of them are still human beings. Um, and they talk with philosophers, artists, and others and say, you know what we discovered today? We discovered that human beings are rational. We discovered that human beings are utility optimizing agents. And that's where the problem happens. Somewhere on the way from the laboratory to the pub, these economists believed their own myth. It was a technical assumption in the morning, and it becomes a philosophical, theological, ethical, anthropological claim in the evening. It's like if a physicist would come to the same pub and said, you know what we discovered today? The friction of air doesn't exist. So we confused our myths, our assumptions, with uh, the real, so to speak. Thank you, Thomas. Yes. Um, I promise the next answer will be shorter. <laughs> <laughs>